you take uh, any higher energy level and suppose this higher energy level and I suppose say uh, I'll take a lower energy level somewhere here. This is a lower energy. When I take lower energy level and higher energy level, we know from the big, from our intuition that the amount of uh, energy that is coming down or going up, whatever you take it, here I am taking another one line here, just a minute. Then we can now write here, this is the lower energy level. This is the number of atoms in the higher energy level N2. This is the number of atoms in the lower energy level N1. This is the higher energy level E2. And this is the lower energy level E1. Now, Boltzmann stated that always there will be more number of atoms in the lower energy level because it's a equilibrium state. And if you supply energy or temperature, if you increase, there may be one or two atoms at the top. But always the number of atoms that are there in the lower energy level is high compared to the higher energy level E2. So how many number of atoms will be there in the higher energy level at a given temperature compared to lower energy level? That relation is given by Boltzmann. So, in the above equation, we know all the constants A21, B12, B21 or Einstein coefficients of uh, spontaneous emission. Oh, sorry, that is absorbed, okay. Induced absorption, emission and spontaneous emission. So now if you look at this equation again uh, and insert that the Boltzmann equation, the Boltzmann equation states that the number of atoms in the lower energy level to the number of atoms in the higher energy level ratio is equal to e power the difference between the energy levels e2 minus e1 by kt where t the temperature at which you are uh, say you, we are following the reaction or we are seeing the transition and k is Boltzmann constant. So if you write this e2 minus e1 as h nu I can now replace this by h nu here and therefore I write this equation simply as e power h nu minus k. <coughs> therefore, now we look at uh, the another important relation, this relation, which we have derived in the previous slide. So, if I now look at this uh, slide here, n1 by n2. I have here n1 by n2. So you try to substitute the n1 by n2 somewhere here in this place. If I substitute that in this place, you can see that the value of n1 by n2 can be replaced by uh, e power h mu by kt. So if I do that, I will get here very simply the equation will become something like this rho mu this is rho mu is equal to a1 by b a21 by b21 as it is then n1 by n2 is replaced by here h nu minus kt and b12 by b21 as it is i am writing it is this is the same thing as this and we have minus 1 is also there here minus 1 is also there therefore you can now see that okay, the equation, if you compare the Einstein equation with the equation what we are here doing and you suppose that this is the energy density given out by the laser. I suppose that laser is simply a source which gives out you light, just like a, uh, what we call it as black body. You know that black body also gives the radiation out when it is heated to some temperature or it absorbs all the light that is, uh, it is uh, 
absorbed previously. Therefore, most important uh, <coughs> consequence here is that <coughs> this equation can be compared with this equation can be compared with black body radiation. So now I am writing here black body radiation given by Planck's law. Planck's law will give you the energy density that means energy per dense unit to the lambda energy density means energy per unit lambda emitted by a black body. And this is the equation derived by Max for a black body, which actually if you draw energy density by taking it on this axis e lambda d lambda we call it as and I take lambda according to Maxwell equation Maxwell's law this will be something going maximum and then positive. So this is the law okay this is due to <coughs> Maxwell's uh, distribution of energy for a black body. So I think you can follow this Yes, any doubts from here? Are you following? So, if I go here and see <coughs> these uh, ones, okay, I now compare the values of the two equations here A1, A21 by B21 must play the role of 8 pi by hc cube and okay and we have this equation as usual this is the same equation we have and therefore this uh, relation if i after comparing you will come to a conclusion that this step must be equal to 1. So therefore, yeah, when I compare the Einstein equation of stimulated emission, spontaneous emission and induced absorption, I can able to see that this equation is almost similar to or equal to the black body radiation distribution derived by Maxwell. Hence, by comparing these two, we can see that the values B Two one and is equal to B one two and A two one by B two one ratio is equal to this. So therefore, if I look at these two equations, we will have another important conclusion that <coughs> to get stimulated emission, these two coefficients are equal. This is the equation B two one is due to the transition from higher level to lower level and here if I look at A21 this is the transition from higher level to lower level. But however these equations are most important to see that to get laser action most important thing is that you should have more number of atoms in higher energy level than lower energy level. And by this equation also you can tell that if I have only two energy levels, those two energy levels, if I say, okay, simply, those two energy levels, if I look at one energy level here, another energy level here, two energy levels here of E1 and E2, then the atoms which are there in the higher energy level, suppose say, two, three, four energy atoms are. If two of them has fallen down, then I have only 50% atoms here and 50% atoms here. Therefore, by pumping at any time from E1 to E2 by using external source, okay, you cannot achieve higher number of atoms in E2 than E1 if I have only two energy levels. Therefore, the most important is that a two level system a two level system means that the system having only two energy levels e1 e2 cannot be used to get population inversion 
because by the time you send some of them up they will fall down because they complete their lifetime almost we have 50% up and 50% down therefore you cannot go on having 60% in e2 and 40% in e1 maximum is 50-50 hence two level energy system cannot be used to produce laser because you cannot achieve population reduction so two level system okay is uh, not for producing not for producing lasers so you have minimum more than two or okay so so thereby you have to see that you should have more number of energy levels than uh, a single energy level or uh, two energy level. so now we will go to the next slide we will see this how it happens now we have seen spontaneous emission and stimulated emission i am comparing them while comparing you can see that the comparison the spontaneous emission always try to give only incoherent light whereas the stimulated emission will give rise to the incoherent wave therefore spontaneous emission is always seen the emission in general light sources whereas stimulated emission is shown only in lasers so there are some differences between spontaneous emission and stimulated emission so this will give rise to the difference between an ordinary light and a light that is uh, having coherence which is called as the which is called as the stimulated emission <clears throat> and next we'll see another important uh, one look at this we have seen already to get so for laser reaction what do you require you require population inversion population inversion means having more number of atoms in the excited state than the ground state that means usually we will have more number of uh, atoms in the ground state and less number of in the atoms in the excited state but if you have something like more number of atoms in the excited state then the ground state we call it as population inversion so population inversion is a must for the laser action so we have seen in the earlier class also that the ground state contains more number of atoms but now try to use some external method to push atoms from ground state to excited state then they will come down from excited state to ground state releasing some energy so that is the population inversion so the first important aspect is that population inversion so the population inversion helps us to get lasing action but this population inversion can be obtained by different means that means you excite the atomic system by using a flashlight xenon light or you can use an electric discharge like tube lights or you can use a photo bias just like a diode or you can use chemical means or you apply some mechanical means so population inversion means that having more number of atoms in the excited state than the ground state and this can be achieved by pumping atoms from ground state to excited state with external energy source that external energy source may be due to incident light called optical pumping or by using electricity called electric discharge or you apply some formal bias and take the electrons to or and electrons and host to higher energy level or use chemical reaction to obtain population inversion or use any other mechanical process or use another laser to get population inversion also 
So thereby you have different uh, means of achieving population inversion. The process what we use to get population inversion by the application of uh, external energy is called pumping. So we need pumping. So the pumping is to get or to achieve population inversion, use external energy and take the atoms from ground state to higher energy state. So the process of taking atoms from lower energy state to higher energy state with the help of external source is called pumping. Pumping helps us to obtain population inversion. So population inversion is one of the most important condition to get laser action and thereby laser light out of the given atomic or molecular system. <clears throat> now, the another important thing is that to get laser, you should have an energy level that could be capable of living long time. Otherwise, you don't have a time to push the atoms down by, ex by the supply of external energy. So, you also know that thereby we can now see that the external energy used for pumping to get population inversion is not only the sufficient condition, you have to have another condition of having more number of uh, uh, a state which is having longer lifetime. So longer lifetime means that this energy state should be capable of holding the atoms for longer time, maybe in milliseconds. So therefore, I am now showing the process of another important lasing action is metastable state. So metastable state is a long-lived life state or longer lifetime state. A longer lifetime state is one which is generally more lifetime than normal state. Normal state will have a lifetime of 10 to the power minus 8 seconds whereas the metastable state even though it is not stable for longer time it will have lifetime more than this maybe having 1 millisecond. So if I compare these two states of normal state having 10 to the power minus 9 seconds and 1 millisecond the difference is uh, 10 to the power almost 6 means you are uh, capable of increasing the time by 10 to the power 6 seconds which is very very huge for us. So thereby the minimum requirements for lasing action if you want to get lasing or laser light from a <clears throat> atomic or a molecular system what we want is the lasing first we should have a population inversion. So population inversion is nothing but having more number of atoms in the excited state than the ground state. So this by itself cannot be created. So the population inversion can be created by using external energy and push the atoms by absorption to higher energy level. That can be achieved by using a mechanism called pumping. Okay. So pumping is important. And once you pump, you will get population inversion. To get the population inversion, third is that you require a metastable state. A metastable state is a state that has have more lifetime. Metastable state is the state having more lifetime than the normal state. <coughs> Hence, the foremost requirements for lasing action are three population inversion, pumping, and metastable state. So, metastable state is a long lived state. So, but in some materials, not all materials, they will provide 
the metastable states. So thereby, there exists some states in a given uh, in a given substance with more lifetime. So that's why I have given milliseconds uh, states. That means lifetime of the state is some milliseconds. So when we have that millisecond lifetime energy le levels, there is a possibility for us to push the atoms at all of them simultaneously down to get a <clears throat> coherent beam of light from the system. So once you know it, now look at this system. Once I have an energy level E1, I have an energy level E2, okay, and I am pumping the atoms from here to the higher energy level. So they are going here. But this is not a this state is not a metastable state. As this is not a metastable state, the atoms will fall down immediately to the another available closest energy level E3. So E3 is a metastable state whose lifetime is more. Therefore, atoms falling from E2 to E3, they stay here more time and therefore we have a population between these two levels. That means here E1 has only one but whereas E3 higher energy level has more number of atoms which is called a population inversion. But the atoms when they are coming from E2 to E3, they will not emit any radiation because <clears throat> the, the energy difference between E2 and E3 is so small that okay, uh, the energy that is dissipated, the energy that is dissipated when it is coming from E2 to E3 level is uh, liberated in the form of heat. That means when the atom is coming from E2 level to E3 level, it will not emit any radiation. It will emit and lose the energy in the form of heat. That's why we call it as non-radiative transition. Non-radiative transition is a non okay is a transition that is due to <clears throat> absorb that is due to emission of the energy in the form of heat. But when you are coming to E3 to E4, E3 to E4, the energy difference is large. Therefore, when it is when the atom is falling, it loses its energy in the form of radiation. That radiation will be in the form of a laser. Hence, thereby we can see that here the population inversion will help us to get a coherent beam coming from E3 to E4. After e, the atoms reaching E4, they don't stay here because it is not a metastable state, it is a normal state. Thereby, after the lifetime, they will fall down and the atoms will come. So, population inversion is between now E3 and E4. <clears throat> Hence, we will now look at the next slide which will tell you what are the basic requirements for a laser system and what are the components. Any laser system Yeah, look at this uh, from E2 to E3 okay if I take it E2 to E3 <coughs> the heat is liberated but radiation is not emitted all those downward transitions during which light is not emitted or radiation is not emitted is called non-radiative transition. It is a very quick process and the energy difference is so small and that energy is only liberated in the form of heat and given to lattice. And this heat is used 
to increase the temperature of the atomic system or the substance you are taking it. And this heat is a negative quantity for us because if the heat is more, more number again will go and randomization takes place and you don't get the stimulated emission, it may lead to spontaneous emission. Thereby, this heat should be minimized. That we will see in the subsequent slides. So, heat is. <clears throat> so, I look at uh, here the various parts of a laser, which we call it as components of a laser. The components of a laser means that what are the minimum components a laser system should have, whatever the type of laser we are taking. If you want to have a lasing action, you need to have atoms in higher energy level. So when you should have an atoms in higher energy level means that there must be some substance, some collection of atoms, some collection of ions or some collection of uh, okay, uh, molecules. These collection of atoms, molecules, ions make a substance. And that substance is responsible for giving atoms or molecules to be excited from ground state to higher energy state, thereby we will get a population inversion. Hence, we require a medium and that medium is a collection of large number of uh, atoms. Therefore, energy levels required by a laser transition are provided by atoms, molecules, ions. So, that substance we call it as active medium. So, active medium is nothing but a substance uh, which we take in a special purpose to create a more energy level population inversion. We can see that so active medium is a substance which is nothing but a medium or active medium is a material. So, this active medium is composed of two parts. The first part is called host and the second part is called active centers. Host is simply a material which hosts the defects. Defects are now active centers. In the crystallography, we have seen that <clears throat> we have some regular periodic arrangement of a crystal in which we add uh, dopants or impurities to get a improved performance of the substance in terms of their properties. Therefore, a host is a material or a crystal lattice and active centers are simply the dopants or the impurities we add. Here you remember that host will not make any important uh, contribution to the lasing action because the active centers are responsible for providing metastable states and metastable states will be populated, uh, will be giving you population inversion. And therefore, the next uh, one which is the important component or part of a laser is pumping source. We, we know that to get lasing action, more number of atoms must be there in higher energy level than lower energy level and this state of having more number of atoms is called <clears throat> population inversion. To achieve population inversion, we want an external source to take the atoms from lower energy state to higher energy state. That external agency we call it as pump source. So, pump source or pumping source is another important part of a laser to get population inversion. Once you have this, to get a coherent beam, we, we want a matching photon to initiate or start 
lasing action and that lasing action is okay given due to the next component of laser called resonating cavity the word resonating cavity means that it is a cavity or it is a some place between which you can keep your active mirror so this place between these two mirrors or something like this we call it as uh, the resonating cavity so the word resonating cavity what we are using is a most important saying that laser is a resonance phenomena we will get resonance between various or maybe uh, e1 and e2 or e3 and e4 energy levels so laser is a resonance resonance phenomena through which we will get coherent beam of light coming out of it and in some systems we require cooling why cooling we have seen in the earlier slide that some transitions are non radiative transitions which will give rise to heat and we have to cool that heat otherwise the heat that is released will make the active medium to get hot and thereby the laser characteristics are spoiled or the laser characteristics will be lost hence we need a cooling system hence i am repeating the components of a laser are importantly three one is an active medium which is nothing but a substance and a collection of atoms molecules ions this substance is generally a crystal or maybe a gas or maybe a liquid but it must host some defect centers which are responsible for giving the metastable states therefore active medium is of two types host and active centers to get a population inversion for lasing action because necessary thing to get lasing action is that you should have more number of atoms in the excited state than ground state so therefore the most important uh, one is to have the population inversion that is given by pumping source next is <coughs> the resonating cavity resonating cavity means that you should able to get a coherent beam means that the light coming out of the active medium should emit light waves which are in phase so all those waves which are in phase will give rise to a coherent beam for that coherence we require a resonating column so what is this resonating column we will see shortly in the coming slides and to decrease the he heating because of non radiative transitions and other uh, uh, transitions we require cooling system next these are the important aspects of any laser system so i am go now going to show you this picture so i am taking an active medium this is an active medium active medium is nothing but a substance and this active medium should be taken into excited level so that more number of atoms will be there in excited state than ground state and hence there are this process is called a pumping process and once the pumping is placed and given the atoms start falling down once the atom is falling from high energy level to lower energy level this will release a photon like this and this photon will go and hit here where i am keeping a mirror and i am keeping another mirror here there are two mirrors one mirror here another mirror here between the mirrors i am keeping the active medium so when i am keeping the active medium you can see now that okay so the area or the space in between which you are keeping the active medium is called resonating cavity so this is actually the distance between the two mirrors is called a resonating cavity why do we require the resonating cavities for getting lasing action suppose say a photon is released here and a photon comes up to the mirror 
here which is partially reflect here is fully reflecting means that light cannot come out of this mirror but light can come out come from this mirror only so there is no possibility of the light coming out from the fully reflecting mirror but the light can come from partially reflected one so once a photon is released this photon goes and hits this mirror and it gets reflected and while it is going reflecting back it goes through this and hits here and it takes another reflection so during each reflection hello now can you hear me is it okay now yes sir yeah are you able to hear me hello yes. sir roll number 42 is trying to join the meeting okay ask them but he is able to join yeah yeah ask them to send a chat i will allow him ask them to send a chat so that i can see that i can allow him okay so uh the most important part here you understand is that when an when suppose say this is moving this is the moving photon when it goes and hits here it gets reflected back but look at this now are you able to hear me hello hello sir there is something yes sir men's voice hello yes sir yeah now i am writing here two energy levels suppose say one atom is here another atom is here in the higher energy level e2 now by some means by spontaneous emission this atom has fallen down so when this atom has fallen down which gives you a radiation whose frequency h nu is equal to e2 minus e1 but remember this is spontaneously drop down uh, photon whose energy difference is e2 minus e1 this is spontaneously one and this spontaneously emitted photon comes here here i kept a mirror and this gets reflected back while coming back it will have a frequency h nu but at the same time the atom which is there in the higher energy state this atom looks at this photon when looks at this photon it thinks that if it also comes down it will also able to give the same fo another photon of same frequency h nu because this atom is also falling between these two energy levels therefore what is happening here is that one atom which is moving in this direction is capable of initiating another atom to come down so one photon going in this direction is now coming back only one photon i have suppose initial which is spontaneously fallen photon but this photon energy is h nu when that photon energy is h nu we now say that okay this photon energy is h nu and we say that the atom which is there at the higher level it looks at the incoming photon and thereby it comes down and while coming down it gives out another photon therefore i have photon 2 because of this transition and photon 1 which is due to spontaneously fallen photon 
so what actually happen is that these two photons will go together here at this and therefore initially we have only one photon which is coming like this this photon while coming it has initiated another one another photon here <coughs> those hello hello yeah now look at this this is a most important consequence you have to understand okay in this uh, one the most important consequence important uh, concept is that one spontaneously fallen photon is going it is initiating another atom to come down so this photon goes this goes two photons are coming and they take reflection and both of them will go and they come here to the other mirror end and they take a reflection and they take a reflection here when they take the reflection while going they make two more atoms in the exit state to come down and while they are coming down these two will give you two more photons but all these photons are having same frequency h nu because they are falling between the same two energy levels that is e1 and e2 hence all the photons between the two mirrors this is m1 say m1 mirror and say m2 mirror between the two mirrors whatever the photons that are generated will have same frequency now these two photons will come here in addition to already the two photons that are moving in the system which get reflected back from the mirror one so we have four photons that means photons are doubled these will take a reflection another reflection and they while going here they make four 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 more atoms to come down and they will become eight likewise for each return trip between the two mirrors so whenever you are looking at the so are able to see the screen yeah look at this okay so these two mirrors one is m1 and m2 how to make them to partially reflect and completely reflect what i do is that i take a mirror like this and i just put it back side of the mirror okay very heavily then it is completely reflecting no light will go out of it whatever the light that is falling on it it will take only reflection no light will go like this but if i take this mirror this is lightly coated okay so thereby it emits the light out of it so therefore we have <clears throat> fully reflecting mirror partially reflecting mirror means that this is 100% reflection and this is 99 or say 95 percent reflection to 95 percent reflection thereby you can see here that the light the photons one photon is going like this it hit it coming back while coming back it initiate another atom to come down and it gives one more photon so two photons are now there two photons will come here these two photons take reflection while going they will initiate two more atoms in the higher energy state because it's a meta stable state more number atoms will be there at more time they will come down 
while coming down you can see that the two atoms will give rise to two more rays therefore i'll get four rays and these four the four will come back i'll get a likewise you can see that every round trip of photons between the two mirrors makes that the two makes them always okay so these two mirrors help us to get amplification so for one round trip we have one and second round trip we have two and the third round we have four and these four when they are going will become eight and likewise four turns are multiplied but you see that very important thing is that l is the length of the one so you can imagine these two mirrors hello some of you could not able to join here we am taking here a break here then i'll start after 30 minutes meanwhile those who are there online they can ask questions